Hi, I'm Stuart Spinks and welcome to episode 234 of my podcast, Beekeeping Short and Sweet. I have some exciting new honey room equipment to share with you today. I know I really should get out more, but hey, us beekeepers just love shiny new stainless steel. Listen in for this and much more. Beekeeping Short and Sweet, a beekeeping podcast for the inquisitive beekeeper with a short attention span. A beekeeper, in fact, just like me. I'm delighted to say that our podcast is now sponsored in part by Simon the Beekeeper. Making beekeeping an affordable hobby for everyone, Simon the Beekeeper provides the best value beekeeping equipment possible, along with a super fast delivery service. The bees won't wait, so their customers don't have to either. Visit the website at www.simonthebeekeeper.co.uk Hi everyone, welcome to my tiny little office here at home. Hot coffee sits beside me and I'm looking out at a particularly drab grey day, but it's still very mild for the time of year. I've been predicting a drop in daytime temperatures for a couple of weeks now, if not longer, and yet the warm winds continue to blow up from the equator, pushing temperatures back up to nearly 20 degrees Celsius. That's 68 degrees Fahrenheit. In these difficult times for families trying to heat their homes, it's probably been a helpful delay from the much colder weather that we would normally have in late autumn and winter. There's always a bigger picture to consider, I guess, but for us beekeepers, it's yet another challenge to consider as we continue our beekeeping journeys. As with most things, there are positives and negatives that walk hand in hand with this whole warm weather conundrum, and I touched on some of them in last week's podcast. It would be useful to now see a change in the weather to colder, more seasonally average temperature conditions. By way of explanation for the beginner beekeeper, it causes the honeybee colony to cluster and slow down their activity. One of the primary reasons for the cluster is to keep themselves and any brood present warm enough to survive. Survival is the name of the game for them as we head into the colder weather of winter, and once the temperatures drop, we don't tend to see warmer conditions here in Norfolk until March again, if we're lucky. During this time, our honeybees don't hibernate. I'm asked regularly by non-beekeepers how honeybees survive hibernation, and I have to explain to them the process of honey production for the long winter haul and why honeybees store all that extra food. So if they're not hibernating, what are they doing? Well, it's mostly long periods of being clustered together to keep warm with occasional breaks for trips out to the toilet and maybe gathering water. Although I have seen bees collecting condensed water from the inside of the hive. There's obviously very limited forage, yet with the plants that we have in our urban gardens, there seems to always be something in flower that maybe the bees might find. Currently, I'm seeing a lot of Mahonia in flower, and the various varieties of Mahonia flower at different times throughout the winter. If we get an occasional warm day during that cold period, don't be surprised to see bees coming back to the hive with yellow pollen, probably Mahonia. It's a tall, spiky leafed plant with long sprays of yellow flowers. Keep an eye open for them, and on warm days you may spot some honeybees on them. One of the challenges our bees face right now is the potential excessive use of food stores. The vast majority of flowering plants our bees forage on have now finished providing nectar and pollen, meaning our bees out foraging will be burning fuel in search of food and return empty-handed, if indeed bees can be empty-handed. The result of this is a net deficit of energy which needs to be replaced, and without freshly foraged food, it will be the stored food reserves that get used. While the weather remains warm and bees continue to fly out to forage possibly unsuccessfully, stored food consumption may increase to the point that the colony's reserves are reduced so that by the time we get through to late winter, maybe the end of January and into February, the pantry might be empty and colonies could starve. 
This is where hefting and maintaining a watchful eye on your colonies will help. There's absolutely no need to panic right now and start dumping fondant on your colonies, but be mindful of the situation now and how it can impact on your colonies in the next few months. I'll come back to hefting in the new year and give you a little reminder as we go around our apiaries and heft. Earlier this week, I travelled down to Oxfordshire to collect a new piece of equipment for the honey room. Not that we're going to be using the honey room for extraction again until our spring crop comes in, but it's a piece of kit I've wanted for a while to help with the workflow as we uncap and extract the frames of honey from our supers. It's a frame rack carousel from Carl Fritz. I had originally planned to collect it at the Bee Farmers Association annual general meeting, but that coincided with me having COVID, so I didn't travel. Kindly, our BFA chairman agreed to hang on to it for me until I could venture down and pick it up myself. Now, this frame rack is basically the shape of a very large bird bath, a rectangular stainless steel stand with a large dish welded to the top of it. Within the dish is what looks like the round framework from an extractor. It sits on a post in the centre and has a ball bearing fitted inside a cylinder which allows the entire rack to rotate. At the bottom of the dish is a gated stainless steel tube where honey can run down and out of the dish into either a bucket or some other container for processing. The rack can hold as many as 72 frames, 48 frames on the outside and 24 frames within the inner section of the rack. The plan is to position the rack between the uncapping tank, which will be fitted with the brush uncapper, and the extractors. As we begin the uncapping and extraction process, the two 28 frame extractors will be filled and fired up to spin out the frames of honey. Previously, we've had something of a pile-up of uncapped frames because uncapping has always been quicker than extracting and the api melter that we used to use doesn't have the room to hold more than a handful of frames. Now what we can do is fill up the frame rack with as many as 72 uncapped frames while the extractors are spinning, meaning the person uncapping the frames isn't waiting for the extractors to be emptied. The temptation previously has been to end the extraction a little early to accommodate the freshly uncapped frames, potentially leaving some of the honey still in the almost extracted frames. Frames held on the frame rack will drain some of their honey while they wait to go into the extractors, which will have the knock-on effect of making the extraction a little bit more efficient and quicker. Of course, using a frame rack very much depends on the extraction room setup that you have, it's a large piece of kit measuring 110 centimetres in diameter, so its footprint is quite sizeable. But with the uncapping process that we have, it should be a massive help in keeping the frames moving from supers full of honey through the honey room and out at the other end. I'll pop a link to the frame carousel in the podcast notes just in case you're tempted. My journey down to Oxfordshire wasn't without incident, I have to say, and thank goodness for intelligent sat-navs. It would normally be a journey of around three and a half hours. Unfortunately, I chose a day when the stop oil protesters were climbing motorway gantries and shutting down the M25. After several sat-nav rerouting changes, I finally managed to get to my destination some five hours after starting out from my home address. Needless to say, I chose a different route entirely to head back home, but it was an extraordinarily long day. Typically, two days later, I was in the same general location as my youngest daughter, Beth, was visiting from the USA, and I was on the collection duties at Heathrow Airport. Once again, the protesters caused the M25 to be shut down just at the point we were heading back home, and we had to make another route change to avoid the motorway that had just become a car park. Like I say, thank goodness for intelligent sat-nav. As I mentioned, the frame rack is quite large, and it got me thinking more about the future of our operation and where we may find ourselves in terms of location. At this point, I should mention, I'm also thinking about my trip to Oxfordshire and the chance to see a fellow bee farmer's honey room set up and ponder how my facility works or doesn't. 
what could I do to make it better? And how could I potentially future-proof what we're doing so I don't have to go through the entire process again in just a few years' time? I'm beginning to think we should consider using shipping containers as a modular setup so we can gradually add components as we need and when we can afford. The most important part of our operation is without doubt the honey room. It has to be fit for purpose and that means a food grade facility that meets all of the regulations regarding food preparation. If I can put something together that meets these rules, it may be possible we could gather all of our kit into one location, the grain store. That said, we still don't have the full access of the grain store, but I do believe it will happen. And as I think I've mentioned before, our lease on the unit here in Norwich ends in May next year, that's 2023. The beauty of using shipping containers is that we can adapt and increase the available space as we need to. And if push comes to shove, we could always up sticks and move the entire operation to another location. Now, I know next season's extraction sessions seem a long way off, but I'm only too aware how quickly the new season comes around. And once we get busy with early season inspections, with swarming, time will just slip through our fingers. Planning and preparation has to start now because we could so easily find ourselves in the busiest part of the swarming season, find our landlords are unwilling to renew our lease and suddenly become homeless. Now, that would be a challenge. I think we'll just keep planning and not get too worried about that scenario. One thing I am thinking about a lot at the moment is our winter microscopy work. I have some really interesting honey samples to check out this winter and I'd really like to identify what pollen is present. If you're interested at all in joining me and finding out where your bees have been foraging, sampling your honey is a great way to begin the detective work. In order to do this, you will of course need a microscope and a few bits of kit to help with the process. And I would very much recommend chatting to the lovely people at Brunel Microscopes for a starter pack if you're just getting started and check out my previous videos on the equipment I use for my pollen slide work. There's not a huge amount required and the investment isn't massive. Maybe something for the Christmas present list, dare I say? Remember, there's only 40-ish days left until Christmas, and then we'll be getting very excited as the new beekeeping season gets ever closer. I do plan to try out some dissection work this year. I've not had calls to do any for many years, but I thought it would be useful for anyone thinking of doing the BBKA microscopy assessment, and just as a general interest for beekeepers everywhere. It's always good to continue to practice these skills, and... I guess you might well see how not to do it. For dissection work, you will need a low-powered microscope, sometimes called a dissection microscope. But other than that, there's not really a lot of kit required. Look out for my videos on the topic as we head deeper into the winter months. Amazingly, I discovered that when we get through to February, specifically the 25th of February next year, again 2023, I will have been publishing my weekly podcast for five years. Now, I don't think we'll hit the exact number of 260 podcasts. That's representing one for each week over that time. But we won't be far off. And I have to say, I feel quite proud of myself for keeping at it for all this time. Hopefully, it's been of interest and I've been able to share some useful information that may have helped you on your beekeeping journey. Podcasts evolve, I think. Topics and presentation styles change and adapt. I wonder how the podcast will change as we head into 2023 and beyond. If there's anything you'd like to hear more about on my podcast, then please do let me know. All the usual channels, of course. Email, direct messaging if you're on Patreon, and not forgetting the other social media routes for making contact. Something we've just discovered, albeit a little late to the party, is something called TikTok. We'll be sharing short video clips of our beekeeping exploits as we head into the more active beginnings of next year's new season. But until then, I'll see if we can find something to keep you amused if it's a platform you're familiar with. We're of course still posting video content to my Patreon page and Steph's uploading more pictures of our antics to Instagram once more. I finished today looking out at a glorious sunny view. The grey skies have given way to a warm and sunny day once more. 
The bees will be out and about again, no doubt. Have a great weekend, everyone, and don't forget to check out my website, www.norfolk-honey.co.uk, and for my latest videos and podcasts with more updates, tips, and techniques, it's the same Patreon page, www.patreon.com forward slash Norfolk Honey. And remember, I'm Stuart Spinks, and that was beekeeping short and sweet. (laughs) 